Hey everyone, welcome back to the Fly Culture Podcast. I hope you're all doing well and I hope you're managing to get out and go fishing. I managed to hit the river yesterday before all the rain has come. This is being recorded on the 13th of May and I managed to get out just before the rain came yesterday. I come down this morning and the river's come up about four and a half feet so far this morning. So it looks set to continue, but always looking for the silver lining. I'm hoping it might bring some salmon into the system as well. So I'm really looking forward to that. So that should be good. Um, my guest today has done just about everything you could think of in fly fishing, from wading a saltwater flat searching for tailing permit, competitive distance casting, teaching people to fish, competitive fishing for England, guiding, managing fishing tackle shops, making fishing films, writing articles and photography too. There's probably some other stuff I've forgotten as well, so apologies if I have. But it's my real pleasure to welcome Jonathan Tomlinson to the Fly Culture Podcast today. Jonathan, it's great to have you here. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Pete. It's nice to speak to you. Likewise. And what are you up to? Are you managing to get out and do some fishing during these strange times yeah it's been it's just been a, a bizarre last 12 13 months so you know like a lot of people probably not got out anywhere near as much as i would have liked um obviously with the restrictions in travel and things um but yeah done a lot of walking walked a lot of rivers as well which has been quite nice been out doing quite a bit of photography um so we've got quite a lot of articles in the bag with myself and mr proctor um some of which have already gone to to, to print and there's plenty more to come for the rest of the year so yeah, it's been it's been a tough tough time. Um, lots of ups and downs. Getting used to, you know, this this terrible pandemic that's hit so many people hard. And it's it's just nice to be, dare I say, it, safe, well, and and healthy. Yeah, that's a very very good point. And it was interesting you said about the walking. And I know we were talking before we started um, recording. And you said you saw some mayflies yesterday as well. I did, yeah. We we finished up finished up with our dinner and thought we were feeling a little bit bloated. Best get out, get a bit of air, get some steps under our belt. So we're very fortunate that now I'm I'm living here in Newbury, so literally about fifty yards as the crow flies from where I am, the, the River Lambourne flows flows past and of course we've got the Kennet as well. So um we went for a, a wee wander last night, saw some beautiful little wild brownies, saw a couple of, of very good grayling. Um, quite a lot of fly coming off, um, some caddies coming off, um, a few little blue winged olives, and, and then out of nowhere, uh, a lovely great big mayfly done hatches off about sort of half past six last night, and was then shadowed by a couple of little wild trout as it as it fluttered above the water. So uh, yeah, it's good to see. You know, it's quite early, twelfth um, of twelfth of May, um, especially with the the weird weather we've been having. You know, we we spoke about how cold the nights have been throughout April and. You know, we've only just started to see the main part of the hawthorn fly here, which is, you know, quite late for us. But they they seem to be out in relatively good numbers, um, and because it's been windy as well, and no doubt they've been uh, falling on the river, and, and the few trout have been getting a bit of weight weight on after the the lean winter. So yeah, it's 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 all starting to come together. But yeah, it's been weird times. Yeah, yeah. The, interesting, you mentioned the hawthorn, and it fascinates me. Um, that hatch and I've been known to be cutting the grass and seeing the hawthorn suddenly come pouring off leave the mower and hit the river but for me personally it's never been a hatch that has really sort of taken off I, I remember one time guiding and somebody asked me about hawthorn and I said yeah it's not a hatch that's really important and of course the only fish we could catch were on hawthorn during that day so that one bit me but I know on the chalk streams it's a it's a hatch that people pay really close attention to isn't it just ahead of the mayfly yeah I think um you know there's a lot of lot of rivers in the chalk streams in particular in the south that they've seen a big decline in their their species and numbers of fly hatching so you know what maybe wasn't such a predominant hatch before or an important hatch has suddenly taken a bit more of a front seat rather than a back seat because of the decline of other species um uh, you know and, and certainly on days when when it's windy they're, they're such they're, they're like the the british equivalent of a, of a cicada in how bad they can fly so you know you have a bit of wind and all of a sudden they're all over the place and they drop it on the water and the fish will happily take them because they're quite a big old meaty morsel um, but if you've got calm conditions, they, they don't get anywhere near the water um, because they can just go where they want and they'll get up in the trees and they'll, they'll mate and, and away they go. Um, so I think it has probably become a bigger hatch in its importance than it probably was in the past. 
Yeah, that's a good point. I remember hitting Roadford actually a number of years ago, and we hit it just right with Hawthorne falling, and we were almost just casting really leaders onto the water, and the fish were just working up as the, as you say, as the flies had blown onto the water and eating those. And that, they're, they're those little moments, aren't they? And during these. I suppose, strange times. It's those little things you focus on, don't you? You think about those special days on the water or those little moments and they sort of pop into your head, don't they? Yeah, I mean, we've seen, also seen an awful lot of, of, of little bit black beetles as well, um, a lot more than I can remember for quite some time. Um, and I've seen plenty of fish splashing on those. But I think probably the, in the last 12 months for me, even more so than previous years, is that I've spent so much time not necessarily fishing but watching rivers or watching other people fish. Um, and I get a great enjoyment out of just walking a river and watching, you know, I'm, t- I'm turning my missus into a, uh, a prime clear river trout spotter now. You know, she's getting really good at it. Um, you know, it's just, just showing her what to look for, you know, having grown up on a tiny little chalk stream in the Lincolnshire walls with small wild fish, they saw you long before you saw them. So if you, if you weren't on your game, you'd never have seen a fish you'd have thought it was devoid so you know even on a fast flowing river with lots of shiny silvery water i can i'm, I'm still picking out fish so um it, it's it, it, the appreciation of the environment and particularly you know it's something that's become very high on the agenda for a lot of people over the last 12 months with you know a lot of people in isolation not being able to see friends and family and mental health and getting out in the fresh air i've i've done more walking in the last 12 months than I've done probably in the last 12 years. Um, not saying that I'm lazy, but I, you, I've made a concerted effort to go out and walk. And then I'm looking at my, my iWatch you know, at the end of the week and I'm like, I'm after 55,000 steps and walk 28 miles. And, and that's a, a regular weekly occurrence that I'm, wa- wa- you know, I'm doing a marathon and walking along rivers around here and canals and lakes. And, and we're blessed here. We're surrounded by it. Um, and I could just, wander off on you know if if the other half's at work i'll take a wander off if if it's not chucking it down with rain and spend an hour or so along the side of the river just watching what's happening and occasionally bump into another fisherman and you know what it's like when a couple of anglers get together regardless of the disciplines whether they're trotting or you know if they if they've been out with the little spinners you you just get chatting um so it's been it's been nice from that you know to get out and, and appreciate the rivers not just with a rod in the hand trying to catch fish myself but I, I could sit and watch fish feeding and, and watch the, how they behave and sit on their lies and how many flies they take and how many of they leave. And yeah, it's, it's, it's always a learning curve. And I think you, anyone that ever thinks in fishing that they know it all, they're, they're sadly mistaken because you never stop learning. And if you think you know it all, give it up and take golf, you know, go golfing instead. Yeah, very wise words. Uh, funnily enough, I put a post out on my personal Facebook yesterday about a fish that beat me up the other day. And I was fishing with a friend and I thought, oh, it's rising. I might get a chance at this. I couldn't catch it. Went back yesterday and watched for a bit, cast, caught it. And somebody said, oh, wow. You know, and I said, that's the really cool thing is that you never stop learning. No matter how much time you spend on the water, you still learn something new. And I try every time I'm down there to try and observe something, learn something, spot something that I can take with me. And like you say, when you talk to other anglers and in the world we live in now, it's easy to share that sort of information. It's good to share that sort of information too, isn't it? Yeah, I think I think fishermen are... It's quite an interesting thing because, you know, in the, in the last few years, we've seen a lot of coarse anglers migrate into fly fishing, particularly people that are married um they've got young kids they've got time constraints they can't go and plan a a two or three day away course fishing trip but they can manage to grab two or three hours on a a small catch and release late like hours um in an evening and you know the stuff's in the boot of the car five minutes after they get there they're they're tackled up and they're off to fish and five minutes after they've finished they're tackled away and they're off to the pub for a pint or go home to see the kids so we've seen a lot of people moving over into the fly fishing but one of the things that they almost immediately comment on is how freely fly fishermen pass on information and help each other you know if you see somebody struggling on a lake uh, i mean i i I do it and all most instructors i know do it is that you know without 
trying to sort of interfere. You'll you'll sort of go over and give them a few pointers and a few a few bits of help to try and improve their casting or give them. You know, you're struggling with you know what you're catching. Well, I've been catching on X, Y, and Z. Here, have one. Whereas they say in the in the course fishing side of things, it's very secret squirrels. You know, it's they they just they don't want to give any information about where they're fishing, how they're fishing, particularly if they're catching big carp more than anything else. They just clam up. And, and they're, they're not open to share that because they think they've got some kind of a competitive advantage over another angler. Whereas they all say in the fly fishing side of things, I walk in here, I don't need to ask. You just tell me everything that I need to know without, you know, there's, there's no there's no sort of premise about what you're going to gain in return. You'll just tell me how to make my fishing better. And I think that's that's great in the fly fishing side of things. And do you think as an instructor as well, and I know when I was guiding stroke instructing that I often used to say to people, I just want you to love it. Even if it's 10% of what I do, that'll be enough. And do you think that's because of the community, like you say, but also that you are an instructor and you teach people because you love it? Um, and do you think some of that spills into those conversations and wanting to help people um, along the way too? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I it's just I, I've been an instructor for a very long time, and, and God knows how many people I've, I've helped to catch their first fish, and it's the, it's the look of sheer joy on their face, and not even if they catch a fish, but the, for the first time they get you know a, 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 something tugs back, uh, and that excitement of you know having a few ounces of carbon fibre in your hand, and all of a sudden you've got two or three pounds of, of mental trout at the other end, running running amok. Um, that excitement, I still get a thrill from teaching, yes, getting somebody to catch their first fish. And as I say, if they will enjoy it, even 10% of how much I've enjoyed it through my lifetime, well, they've got years ahead of them of, of having a really good, enjoyable, healthy outdoor pastime. And the more people that we can pass that on to, particularly younger generation, um, and I think from a, from a fishing point of view or an industry point of view, the pandemic's probably actually given fishing a bit of kick up the backside because we've seen a lot of people that are now time rich, um, particularly if they've been on furlough. Um, they've been able to travel, you know, they, they, they did some brilliant stuff with making, you know, talking to the government and getting fishing on that list of activities that you could do. Um, and people have gone, do you know what, I haven't fished for 20 years or um, I've always wanted to, but I've not had the time. Well, now I've got some time. Um, I'll take it up. And, and we've certainly seen sales and I'm talking to other guys in the industry, sales of like beginners kits, starter outfits, really, really picking up of people coming back into the sport all first time. And so it's probably been as big a, inadvertently as big a year for people getting back into it or, or getting started that I could probably ever remember for 20 years, probably. So, you know, every cloud has a, a silver lining to a certain extent as far as the fishing industry goes. But you know, on the back of what's been an incredible, sad humanitarian crisis to here we go, people are starting to take up fishing. We, we, you know, it's, it's good that people are getting out there. I think people have spent far too much time indoors over the last 13 months. So, you know, getting out is, is great for them. And I hope that trend continues as well. And I, I kind of think that, you know, we've had this spike, as you say, and guests previously on the podcast have said that as well. And it, it does make me wonder if was seeing that sort of spike that we saw in the Stillwater boom of the 70s, 80s, and whether we can maintain and keep those people engaged within fishing. And that will be a really interesting one to see if that continues down the line in, say, a year's time, two years' time, if those people... And like you, I'm, you know, I get people contact me almost daily saying, I'll just come back to fly fishing after a long gap it's been wonderful so i try and do everything i can to encourage them like you say give them information and i think if we can continue to motivate those people to want to do it that's a that's a good sign for our industry isn't it and our and our pastime yeah, I, and passion yeah absolutely um and i, and I also think that uh, from the point of view of accessible fishing there's never been more day ticket waters or places for people to be easily able to get to where they've got a good chance of catching a fish. Um, depending on where you are on the country, obviously in the south the fishing is far more expensive because it tends to lead towards big fish, catch and kill waters, less catch and release waters. But as you go up the country, 
you know, you can go and fish a day for, for what in re- relative terms is far less than the cost of a round of golf. Um, and you say it doesn't have to be a, a, a big planned out five, six, seven hour event. You can just go and fish for a couple of hours and, and, and head home again. So, you, you know, the people are going to be able to get that accessibility, which is great. Yeah, yeah, long may that continue. Now, before we move on, because there's so much I want to talk with you about, but um, you mentioned, obviously, the Lambourne and the Kennet being nearby, and they're obviously sometimes, and perhaps wrongly so, overlooked by the the big-name chalk streams of of Hampshire. But interestingly to me, you also mentioned the Lincolnshire chalk stream that you grew up fishing as well and it's those lovely not so well known little streams that are to me are fascinating and that lincolnshire one don't have to name names or anything like that but they, they sound fantastic little venues yeah i mean I, I was i was very fortunate um that when i first got into fishing the, the person who ultimately ended up being my instructor just after i'd been out for a couple of you know days half-assed fly fishing not really knowing what i was doing but being fortunate enough to catch a big fish you know my first fish i think was six pound 15 ounces from a small still water where i lived so of course you know age nine i was like wow this is easy you know <laughs> i'm hooked um and my dad said look it seems like you really enjoy it I'd, I'd course fished since ever i could remember um and he said well you know let's let's get you a lesson and see how you get on and, and it was a a guy a, an excellent instructor who i learned an awful lot from uh, called Robert Gibson Bevan, um, who had this small syndicate of, I, th- I think it was something like 40 rods um, for six miles of a, a river called the Great O in the Lincolnshire Walls. Um, not a very well-known river at all, but um, it is a chalk stream. Um, and when people think about chalk, they always think about the south of England, you know, Hampshire, Wiltshire, um, but it actually, if you, if you look at a map of, of the UK, it goes all the way around through Suffolk and Norfolk into Lincolnshire up into Yorkshire, um, the, this, this raft of chalk. And the, there are chalk streams all over the place. Um, uh, you know, obviously your big names, you're always talking about the Test, the Itchin, the Avon, rivers like that. Um, but there are lots of others that you can find. Um, Driffield Beck, you know, that's, I think that's the, the most northern chalk stream that we, we have. Um, but they are all over um and it's it's a very different type of fishing to a, a freestone rain fed river um where you know you can ultimately if you if you've got a half decent pair of polaroids and you've got a bit of an eye for for detail and movement you can spot the fish and you can target the individual fish that you're going at whereas the sort of stuff that we quite often do with the the chalk stream the non chalk stream the the freestone rivers you can't very often see the fish unless the light's in the right position you're in the right place the fish is on the right lie so you're having to think like a fish so it's a very different set of of disciplines for each one um but i grew up you know it was eight to 15 foot wide in places 20 probably at the most little six foot rods three and four weights um wild fish so substituted with a few stock fish but that was my grounding for all of my future fishing. I, I really did more on the rivers long before I started big on the still waters. So making that transition from river to still water, for me, I always find is far, far easier than going from still water to river because you have a lot more river craft as a river angler than you do river craft and water craft as a still water angler. So you're at a distinct advantage going from river to still than still to river. Um, so I was, I was in the lucky position that I was, I had that extra step when I did turn more to the Stillwater side of stuff, which I thoroughly enjoyed and still do, but I, I, running water is, you know, that kind of living, breathing, changeable thing that a river is. I, I, I still, with my trout fishing, get the most enjoyment out of rivers. So that six pounder. Um, was that sort of the like you say as a youngster catching that great big fish did the course fishing as a result of that sort of fall by the wayside or were you continuing to do that did you sort of you know think yeah fly fishing that's it and then having Robert as a, a mentor was that just natural that you you flowed into that from from there I, I kind of 
I would do whatever I was able to get my hands on. If that meant, and I, and I do miss my course fishing, and it's something that I'd like to like to get back into more of. It's one of those things, you know, sitting by a, a float next to some lily pads, lily pads, watching some tench bubble or something like that. I, I miss that. Um, and it's something that, you know, I'd like to get back into, particularly because I'm surrounded by course fishing lakes here within a five minute walk. Um, but the fly fishing did very quickly accelerate to become the number one choice. Um, and then, you know, uh, developed onto fly fishing for carp, because, again, I had a carp lake that was very close to me. And I had course, I had fly fishing tackle and spoke to the owners and said, yeah, no problem at all. And this is going back to probably around about 93 to 96, something around. It's quite a long time ago. And we were fishing, you know, carp on the fly. Um, but the fly rod as a method of fishing certainly became the, the number one priority over course fishing. Yeah. And I remember that you were obviously writing about these things for, for a very long time. You've been, been doing that and the instructor side of it, I know we've touched on it and where did that, nat cause I, I seem to recall that you were qualified at a seriously young age, weren't you? Uh, yeah, if memory serves me right, I was 16. Uh, myself and Sean Cockliffe both qualified at the age of 16. So we were the two youngest around. Because prior to that, I think you had to be 21 or, or at least 18 to do your, your exams. So as soon as we both turned, turned old enough, we, we did our, um, what in those days was, was STANIC, the Salmon and Trout Association's National Instructor Certificate. So... Uh, yeah, just just coming up this year to my fortieth birthday, so I've been an instructor way longer than I have been uh, not an, an instructor. So, uh, but it's yeah, it was one of those things. We kind of a few suggestions here and there, and you know, when you're at school and someone says, "What do you want to do for a living when you grow up?" and it was like, "I want to, I want to fly fish. I want to fish. That's that's what I want to do." Um, and and kind of yeah, always got you know that was always my lead. Um, my desire was to to be inside of the fishing industry. Um, and, and, you know, it, it, it came to fruition. Um, and, I mean, you know, my father used to say to me, God rest his soul when he was still alive, if you do something you enjoy for a living, you'll never work a day in your life. And to a certain extent, that's absolutely true inside of the fishing industry. Um, he never told me I'd never be a rich man, um, which he should have done. Uh, I could have worked a bit harder at school then. Um, but you enjoy your life. Uh, you enjoy your lifestyle. And I've been very fortunate to get into the fishing industry and... and to a certain extent, make a little bit of name name for myself, and and I've had a lot of you know benefits from that, and I've been to a lot of amazing places. Yeah, yeah, we'll come on to those places shortly. I'm still interested to learn your sort of timeline there, and being an instructor at 16, and then deciding, making that decision that fly fishing was for you is really, really interesting. And again, without appearing stalkery, I seem to remember that you were <laughs> um, working in the Orvis store somewhere or other and was that your first sort of job as it were within in um fly fishing uh inside of fly fishing yeah i mean i'd, I'd, I'd helped in a, in a local course fishing stop shop when i was you know much younger um and then went to university uh, finished my degree at the same time as orbis were opening their outlet store in spalding so i ended up coming straight out of university and straight into uh, assistant manager of the store in uh, in Spalding, and then they opened up a store in Bakewell, um, and I transfer over there uh, as assistant manager under a good friend of mine, Gemma Tibbles. Um, and then she left because she had a great opportunity to go elsewhere, and and I took over as manager. And I was there for for several years before Sportfish were advertising for a uh, an instructor, um, and then uh, yeah, I, I went solely down the route of, of just completely fishing tackle rather than the ladies clothing and the outdoor apparel that comes with with the Orvis side of things and and yeah and I started the sport fish 2008 so yeah it's been a, a fair old time with them now so it's uh, the south is now very much my my home and and we're we're lucky with the teaching school that we have a lot of, a lot of people coming through and you know from from people that are a complete and utter first timers who've never picked up a fly rod which is always the best place to start through to people that want to learn a little bit of improver 
more advanced and then guys that also think you know i'd like to to learn some really advanced distance casting techniques or or i want to i want to hone my salt water techniques so that i can punch that fly a little bit further for for those you know hard to reach fish or you know i just want to add another 10 or 15 feet to my spay cast or i want to use my left hand and you know we, we can take all that stuff is tailored to the individual but it's, it's it's a great platform to not only teach and pass on information to, to first timers or improvers um but just to you know to see the enjoyment that people get and, and to help them to improve their catches you know, is i just yeah uh, it's it's been a big part of my life for so long now the teaching and i i still get that thrill it's fascinating what you say about the teaching at Sportfish because to me that is you know from where I was doing it I knew what I was getting from that day with the person but there must be there particularly so much variety that you're getting on a day in day out basis aren't you of, of lessons that you're giving and the tuition you're giving yeah you, you do you get you get a whole massive range of a massive gamut of people from who say the very first time they're coming and doing the beginner still water courses through to guys that, and, and this is what I really like to see is we have guys that come and do the beginner still water course. And then six months later, they come and do their first day's chalk stream. And then another six to 12 months later, they come and do a residential wharf course where they're learning Northern freestone river fishing with every other technique under the, you know, under the sun and how to read a river catching wild fish then they've progressed to that and then they'll go into a sea trout course down on the towie and then they'll get into the sea trout fishing and before you know it, they've got a double hander in their rod uh, in their hands and they're fishing on the tine and the spring river course uh, and then the year after they go well I've, I've booked to go for a week in mexico and you're like now that's that whole transition from having never picked up a rod before to you go out catching bonefish this is wicked and you've watched them through every stage um it's 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 great to see how people progress as well you know so yeah it's, it's very varied but you, you do see people come back and, and you watch them grow through their through their their fly fishing career and it's, it's great to see fantastic while we're on casting i know you've competed in uh, competition i guess distance casting um how have you found that and what can you give me a sense of what a competition tends to be like so uh, competitions have changed an awful lot um, over the years. Um, from my point of view, basically the only competitions you used to get in the old days were the likes of uh, Chatsworth Angling Fair, CLA Game Fair. Um, there'd be a few little country shows here and there where there'd be a casting competition, and that was, was pretty much it. Um, and I, I, you know, I was fortunate that, that I'd, I'd been to most of those shows and I'd won an awful lot of those those competitions. Um, and then uh, it was probably around about 2004 because once it was a bit of a, a gentleman's agreement that when you became a qualified instructor, you didn't go and do your Chatsworths and your game fairs and things like that because you were a, a qualified instructor. So it kind of all went on a back burner for me then. Um, and then I got involved with the BFCC, the British Fly Casting Club, um, around, I say it was probably around 2004, somewhere around there. And then all of a sudden you had a specific club that did distance casting competitions um, and they did them several times a year around the country and it gave you an opportunity to do a five weight distance a seven weight distance um, doing S, you know, T38 uh, the proper tournament casting stuff the T120 double handed tournament casting stuff and then whispers sort of developed um, that there was going to be a, a world championship in fly casting using fishing tackle so not the out and out hardcore tournament casting stuff but using fishing rods with fishing lines that we would use to go out every day and do our trout fishing um and that was going to be 2010 was was the first one in norway um so there was a very small contingent of us we we got together i think it was only i think it was about two or three from gb um plus uh from england a few guys from a couple of guys from scotland and a few irish guys who at the time that was kind of like the whole the whole British upper echelons of distance casting together in one place, you know the likes of Jared Downey, Rory Costello, James Chalmers, um, Pollard and myself, Lee Cummings, and that was pretty much it. Um, 
and then it started to, to develop. There was another one two years later, another one two years later after that. Um, and then Lee Cummings very much took it by the, the scruff of the neck and, and brought on with the UK United Kingdom fire casting team. Um, we hosted in 2018, um, a fantastic event that it was. Um, and, you know, it's, it, it's just gone on from there and it's, it's developed hugely, not just in the amount of support, but also if you, if you look at back at, at distances from um, 15 years ago, you know, you would win a five weight distance with 100, 105, maybe 110 foot. Now, if you're not doing 125, 120, depending on the weather, you probably won't even finish top three or top five. And regularly, you're having to cast in excess of 130 feet to place, which is a phenomenal increase in distances. Um, but with that change from the out and out tournament stuff to the fishing tackle side of things, new disciplines came into it as well. So we had the five weight distance casting, which was a five weight scientific anglers MED 120 fly line. So we all use the same fly line. You can use any rod up to nine foot long. I think it is uh, any line rating. So you were having guys casting with eight weights, nine weights, seven weights, five weights, whatever suited their, their casting or the conditions. You had uh, what they called the sea trap distance, um, which is a 27 gram shooting head uh, rods up to 10 foot. Um, casts there can be, you know, six, uh, high 50s into low 60s metres, uh, which is a phenomenal distance with, with a 27 gram fly line. Um, 15 foot salmon overheads with a 55 gram shooting head. Um, and these distances go upwards of 70 metres. Um, you had your traditional five way accuracy um, casting, which we've all seen before. Um, and then you had your 15 foot spay from water, which was a, a combination of a left hand up and a right hand up. So you had to do off both shoulders. Um, winning distances for that can be 120 meters. You know, you're looking at 60 meters off each side. Um, and then your 18 foot spay from platform, which is either left or right. You can choose depending on whether you're left handed or right handed, which one's your dominant hand. Um, and again, I think the world record now is 77 meters for a single spay which is, is monstrous, which most of those, a lot of the world records had been set up in, in Milham at the, the UK hosted world championships. And to see a, a spay line going 70 metres plus, and it wasn't just like, that's a one-off cast at 70 odd metres. It was like, there were several guys on the same day broke the world record in one day. Uh, we were standing there watching it. It went from like 70 metres, 0.63 to 72, to 74, to 76, to 77. You're like, this is just, I mean, this is phenomenal. This is out of the world distances. Um, and that's, you know, it, it, we, we love the distance casting side of stuff. Um, and there's a great, a great team spirit amongst the guys. We all support and help each other. We obviously all want to win as well. Um, you know, we had the first UK, UK overall championships in 2019. Um, at the same location where we had the men's, we had the veterans and we had the women's, which I was fortunate enough to win the overall men's title. Um, but we all like to help each other out as well. You know, we we're, we're support each other a lot because it, it's it, it's an expensive pastime for just casting. Um, and we, you don't get financial support because nobody's interested in giving you money to go and cast long distances in a field somewhere. Um, so, you know, for each individual, you've got to spend a lot of time and money buying lines, rods and things like that, which are never going to see a fly. They're just purely for hiking it as far as you can. Um, and we, we yeah, it, it's, it's a whole different sport inside of fly fishing. Um, and they're very separate, but equally they, they also link very well together. If you can cast a fly a long way, then, you know, if you can chuck 120 feet, how easy is it then to throw 80 feet with perfect presentation? So even if you go, well, I'm a fly fisherman, but I'm not interested in distance casting, improving your casting will improve your fishing. There is no doubt about that. Um, and yes, they are separate disciplines, but they do very much come together and interact to improve each other. Yeah. 
to me at least, uh, putting that into context as well, some of those distances, and I use the five weight purely because I played with it a little bit with Lee, funnily enough. Um, and, you know, people often say, well, I cast the full fly line, so they assume that's 90 foot plus 10 foot of leader, which we know is probably 70, 80 feet against the tape measure. So that 125, I think I've thrown it once close to, short of that, not 125, but I think I got low 120s if that it was a complete fluke i'm sure but it's an extraordinary thing and why you were saying that it was fascinating to think about it because i had jason borger on here um a little while back and we were talking about the golden gate club and i was thinking well it'd be a dream one time to go along there and have a little bit of a cast and i always get the impression that's quite a busy place with lots of people and you know i think he said as a youngster they were hanging around there and the ray jeff brothers and everything else um whereas here it seems a small dedicated bunch of people do you do you sense that's the case and is there a way of getting more people interested in it i know you tour around the UK doing various events. Do you get good turnout from that? Do you add people to that? Or is it just one of those things, like you say, is a is a different um, aspect of what we do, yet, as you rightly say, it is something that is going to improve your fishing if you do it? Well, the, the BFC started, BFCC started to take over the, the casting at um, the CLA, what was the CLA Game Fair, um, a, a few years back and then brought in those world championship events at the show rather than just a, a straight out distance and a straight out uh, accuracy. So it also gave us another opportunity to have a competition. So, you know, we would, the group of us would, we, we'd, we'd man it, we'd judge it, we'd compete in it, you know, so we took complete ownership of that. Um, but equally the people that, that came along, we were introducing and doing tuition at the same time um, and it just let that whole thing grow. You know, the likes of Mike Heritage would be doing a lot of tuition with other people. Uh, I mean, so many names, I, I know I'll miss people out, but apologies, because I have. Um, but, you know, it's it, we were not only bringing people on and teaching them as well to get a little bit further. Because when, when you stand there and you look at, you know, the likes of James Evans or Steve Parks or Lee standing on a platform, lobbing a single-handed rod, 130 140 or you know with an st27 way in excess of that people just stand there in awe and watch and they go i want to do that i want to try that and then you know the likes of mike heritage will be standing there going come this way let's let's go and have a cast you know it's so you, you fiver for your 10 minutes or whatever it is of a tuition which goes back into funding the club um and, and, and off they go and they and the next year you see them and they, and they come back at the next show and they're like, yeah, I've been practicing. And, and all of a sudden they've added 15, 20 feet to their cast. And it's it's that that's that's given them the little kind of G on to, to, to get into it and put a little bit of time and effort into it. And then you find, you know, my fishing's improved because of it. And it's all just because they've, they've you know, stood there and seen someone on a casting platform chuck into the horizon and gone, wow, I'd like to have a crack at that. So we, we are growing it um, and we, we've, you know, we've grown the membership, um, but it is still quite a, a niche thing that, that a lot of people just look at and go, I'm not interested in it because I catch fish. But, you know, each to the rain. Yeah, yeah. Um, while I've got you on that, though, you know, one of the common things, as you've mentioned, is people wanting to cast a little bit further. What advice would you give someone... Um, apologies for putting you on the spot a little bit but what advice would you give someone looking to improve and cast a little bit further uh, there's lots of things to look at i mean being inside of the trades it, we very much have the the fortune that we can try lots of different lines with lots of different rods and quite often with a lot of people it's it's not a case of stripping their casting back down to zero um, and then building it back up from, from you know, the, the ground. It's a little tweak here and a little tweak there makes a massive difference out there. Um, but even just something like buying a different fly line, um, you know, with the best will in the world, Joe Average can't cast a 50-foot head, you know, a 50-foot of weighted part of the fly line. 
where they need to aerialize that line to get the most out of the fly line. But if you put them down onto a 32, 35 foot head, well, all of a sudden you're only on three, three and a half rods length worth of line that you have to aerialize before your rod is at full bending, you know, full loading, and then you can shoot. Um, and it's, it's little things like, you know, blokes, especially in fishing, we are the worst for it. If we want to try and cast 60 feet, we'll try and aerialize 59 and a half feet of that line and shoot six inches. The whole point with fly line design and how much they've come on is that they are not only designed to make your life easy, they're also idiot proof. You've got bright pink and bright green and where the bright pink and the bright green meet, that's your optimum loading point. When that gets to the end of the rod, let it go. Don't do an extra two, three, four, five casts and, and collapse the cast. Pick up the heavy bit, shoot the thin bit. And, and it's little tweaks like that. Just the understanding. Because if you, if you haven't had somebody explain it to you, it is a minefield. Because there's so many different lines out there with so many different tapers. And some will, every, man, every man's casting technique is slightly different. Some will suit some, some won't suit others. And it's just looking at somebody for five minutes and you can automatically go, right, if I give you this line on that rod that you've got, that automatically is going to change your, change your cast. If I then show you exactly where to load it from, even if I don't teach you a single hole, a double hole, drift, anything like that, I can just simply give you that fly line and explain to you how to use it. And automatically you'll make less false casts, you'll cast further, and in theory, you'll catch more fish. And it's a little simple thing like that. But if you haven't got the ability to go to a shop and do that, and sadly, there are more and more shops shutting all the time. And as great a thing as the Internet is, it's there's no substitute for going in and speaking to somebody face to face and picking something up and trying it. Um, and, and, you know, long, long should we continue to try and preserve the tackle shop because there's far too many empty shops with vacant written outside of them these days um, where you can't do that. And you can you can, you can't get that information online that you can face to face physically holding it. So yeah, just a few tweaks here and there can change people's casting by you know fifty percent in five minutes just from changing their tackle setup, um, just simply with a fly line. Great points there, and um, you know it's music to my ears what you're saying there because. For so long on here as well, we've been talking about the importance of the fly line. Think about the fly line for the fishing you're doing, and that makes your life so much easier. So that's absolute music to my ears. So thank you for that. We're going to move on a little bit. Um, I know your your equal is at home with a camera in your hand as well as a fly rod, and you've shot many covers for magazines and articles and like you say but i know you did one for trout and salmon a couple of months ago and um articles and everything else that goes with it but i wanted to go back a little bit further and have to say how much i thoroughly enjoyed the film that you made a year in the life that took us um around the world pretty much chasing fresh and saltwater um fish that must have been amazing fun to do and to put together too it, it was. I mean, it was. It was a. Uh, it was one of those you sort of sit down and have a beer with with Matt McHugh at Fly Odyssey, and we were sort of thinking about what we were going to do over the next twelve, eighteen months. With, you know, I was doing a lot of hosting and and, and taking trips around around the world with with clients with him, and um, uh, more and more the the filming side of things had sort of gone in. We 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 made a couple of films prior to that. We'd done you know the Uncharted Waters, Bassus the India film, the Uncharted Waters, the Primeras, which were a little bit out of left field for for a lot of anglers. And I decided I wanted to make something that was purely fly fishing. Um, so uh, I was very fortunate that you know Fly Odyssey and Matt gave me a great help as they always do with going like finding different locations and then tagging along with some great anglers so you know as we've spoken about before paul proctor and i have been great friends for 20 for too many years um and we've been fortunate we've fished together all over the world um and he i never tire of watching paul fish because i always learn something when i watch him um and he's great in front of camera and you know that if there's a an eight pound wild brown he's sitting in some little tiny back stream in new zealand sipping on whatever you can normally put your mortgage on it that he's going to put a good presentation on it and if somebody's going to pull it out for camera quite often it's going to be him um 
I had uh, the legend that is Charles Jardine. He was also involved in the in the chalk stream side of things. So we we did yeah English chalk streams. Um, there we had uh, God rest his soul Manuel Chac over in Mexico at Casa Viejo Chac chasing saltwater species. Uh, we went out to see the guys in Christmas Island out in the Pacific. Um, just an all round amazing location as well as you know not just from a fishing point of view but obviously the history that goes with it with testing of the nuclear bombs and and you know um we we headed up to iceland uh myself and paul um to fish uh some the mini valalaka and the big laxa so some some an incredible fishing in iceland just on our doorstep and then a couple of weeks in new zealand um you know, traipsing around and, and yomping miles and miles to try and find some monstrous fish so all in all, it was, you know, five, five locations. We filmed over uh, 12 months um, and it was about an 18-month project from start to finish to give us the, the finished 60-odd minute film. Um, and it's, yeah, it was it was a real pleasure making it. Um, I, I could have made it five hours long. Um, it, it was, it, the hardest part was getting it down to sort of 60 minutes or so because there was just so much stuff I had to leave, lose and, and, and leave on the cutting room floor. Um, but, you know, watching those guys, uh, Jilly Bate was another one that was involved. Um, Mark Windsor, um, Duff Batty, you know, watching them. And it, it wasn't because we all love a bit of fish porn. Let's not lie. We all love seeing big fish around the world. Um, and I, I didn't want to make it one of those films that was... Lots of hooping and hollering and shouting and high fiving and I wanted something that was I wanted a finished product that you could sit down and watch with your missus who doesn't have any interest in fishing and at the end of sixty minutes she'd go, We should book holiday to New Zealand or I'd love to go to Iceland and it was more to do with the locations and why why every year you travel forty eight hours to the other side of the world on a tin can? Why do you religiously go to back to Mexico? What is it? What's the, the lure of, of you know rivers like the Test and the Ichim and the Frome? Why do you keep coming back to them? Um, what is it about permit that makes you shake like a shitting dog every time you see one? And it was getting inside of the, the minds of not just the fishermen, the guides as well, and seeing stunning locations that any one of us can go and visit. Um, and equally, you know, most of them are relatively good value. You know, you're not talking about 15 grand for a week in Cosmolivo. This is, you know, you, you, you're going and doing a week for a couple of grand in Mexico. Um, so it's, it's also stuff that you could realistically, even if it meant saying 18 months from now, two years from now, I'm planning it now. You can you can manage to, to save the money to do it. So it was accessible fishing. But it was it was why do people keep going back to these places? What's the lure of it? What what gets in here and in here? that says, shit, I can't wait to come back. You know, that, that big fish sitting on that lie in the mini and you're going, that was nine pounds last time I was here. It's 10 now. I still haven't caught it. The next time it'll be 11 and I'm going to get it. Um, so it was more doing a, I suppose you could call it a travel documentary with fishing rather than here is an out and out fish porn film. You've got the action. You've got beautiful vistas, you know, lovely scenery. You've got the pieces to camera that of each individual telling you, the viewer, why you need to get off your ass and go to these places and why they keep going back. Um, so it was, it was something a bit different. Um, and I had lots of people uh, when the first film first came out, cause it was, it was available first just on Vimeo and then now you can get it on fishing TV. Um, but I had lots of people message me and say, I sat and watched it with the missus. And she says we can go to Iceland next year or she really wants to go to Mexico. Um, and she enjoyed the film because it wasn't just fishing. It was the whole package that makes us get out of bed in the morning and pack our shit into the car and go fishing um, or travel 20 odd hours across the side, other side of the world. And that's what I was looking for. And, and I'd like to think that's exactly what we achieved and certainly what people have said. That's that that is what we achieved. So, yeah, I was very, very pleased with the end result. Well, I think you pulled it off. And my next question is, would you like to do another one? And have you, would you, yeah, is there a way that you can do another one? Are you going to? 
Uh, I'd absolutely love to do another one, um, even if it was just a case of do, just doing a specific location. Um, and I think it, it's a difficult one because everybody sits there and goes, there's not enough fishing being done on film of good quality that I can sit and watch that is not five minutes long. I want to sit down for an hour. And then you spend all that time and all that effort and all that money to produce a film that's an hour. And then you go, here you go, here you go guys. And everyone watches the trailer and they go, that's amazing. I love it. Can't wait to see it. And then you go, it's five ninety nine to rent it. And they go, what? I've got to pay for it. And you go, well, yeah, because there's this hundreds of hours and thousands of miles and, you know, just expensive excess baggage. And, and you go, I'm not doing this to make money. I know I'm never going to make money from it, but equally, I'm not doing it just for the love of it. It needs to pay for itself. And it's, there's a real reluctance of people to want to, they, they cry out for it. But when it comes to it, even like five ninety nine, which is what, you know, living in the South, that's about a pint and a half. Um, they're reluctant to put their hands in the pocket to watch it. Um, and I've seen a lot of stuff as well that you, you see a trailer for something and you go, oh, that looks amazing. And then you see that the finished film is 18 minutes long and you're like, I want it to be an hour. I want to sit down and watch something that's, that I can, you know, crack open a beer, just immerse myself in it for a long period of time. Um, and it's, it's, it's difficult to try and or financially justify doing it because it is money that's coming out of your own pocket and it's money that's coming out of the pockets of, of the likes of Fly Odyssey and the Lodges and things like that. And it just needs to be something that isn't going to be a loss. It has to break even. Um, and if people give it the support to make sure that these projects that people do break even or even make a few quid, then people will continue to make them. But if the support's not there, people can't cry out for it to be done if they're not willing to support it when it's finished. And, and you know, we, we were, I was very fortunate with that film because it got lots of really good reviews and, and people raved about it. Um, and it did cover its costs. Um, and, 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 you know, it, but I'm not putting down a down payment on a new Porsche. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I, I suppose YouTube makes that difficult, <clears throat> doesn't it? With people uploading content, like you say, in some cases, not in all cases, but in some cases, good, that makes that difficult. And I guess the difficult dile or the, the dilemma that you have to go down or you want to go down to fund these things to allow it to go out into that mainstream is probably sponsorship, isn't it? It, it is. And, and the other side of things you get with sponsorship is that, and, and I, I've been very fortunate, you know, the likes of Costa, Sage, Rio, Nautilus, Columbia, just to name a, a few of, of the sponsors that we've had in the past on various projects. And they're brilliant when it comes to, to giving you all the tackle that you need. And when you go into some of the places out in the middle of nowhere where you know you're going to kill 8, 10, 12 fly lines on coral and things like that, it's a godsend to have that big bag of extra lines, um, to have those flat shirts, to have the good glasses, to have rods and reels and spare rods and reels for your spare rods and reels. Because when you're in the middle of nowhere, if you haven't got it with you and you run out, you're stuck. Um, and that side of things is fantastic, um, but there's there's very little in the way of any kind of financial production costs cover, um, which, you know, and I understand why. And, it, you know, and it's been the same in, in every every type of fishing sponsorship related side of things for years. And you only have to look at the competition side of fishing where prize money used to be up here. And it's, it's slowly dropped over the years to to where, you know, a first prize is. 500 or a thousand pounds where it used to be 10,000 plus pounds and there isn't the people don't want to pump the money into physical hard cash into things like that because they're not going to see likely see the return on it but they can give you the tackle and stuff which you know we absolutely appreciate more than you can imagine because it's you know not just shipping stuff around the world but having your guys using stuff that, that isn't going to let them down you know, godsend but it physically getting cash for filming projects is a very very difficult thing to do that's why there's a lot of sort of crowdfunders and, and you know 
startup setups that where people are raising funds because people don't actually realize how expensive filming is and it's not just the huge amount of time in edit and filming and transport and everything else but it's the tens of thousand pounds you know a worth of equipment that, that whoever's doing it has paid for in the first place as well um their experience and you know all the audio equipment and everything else that goes with it it's a massive thing and you, you and i see it with having with clients they go oh well i'm only looking for a two minute finished film for my for my website and you go okay that's that's great it's just two minutes you know it, it's 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 an easy thing to do and you go well it, it might be a two minute finished article but it, it isn't two minutes to do it you know you've got a lot more that goes into it you've got to film it you've got to edit it you've got to sort out the sound you've got to sort out the coloring you know you then got to put in all your titles and everything else and finish that two minutes that you think oh that's amazing for two minutes but there's a there's a lot of hours goes in to making that finished product and that's the the problem is that people don't appreciate what goes into it um yeah. and it, you know when you when you balance that between your finished products and the amount of time that goes into it it's a tiny tiny little bit is the finished product in comparison to how much time goes into it um and the monetary you know cost that goes into it as well so yeah it's it's equating one to the other is very difficult for most people that haven't got any idea of what really goes into the production of any kind of film yeah yeah and i always say even in the background in our little magazine that editing um, takes a hell of a lot of time and with a film I can't imagine how much goes into that and to get it right and everything that goes with it so you have my utmost respect for that um, so you've travelled a fair bit um, where is your dream destination where's the one place that you've not been or the place you would love to go back to I think if I could if I could go in money no object go anywhere I would love to take Cosm Lido off my my list at some point. Uh, Cosy's been one of those places that you know, especially throughout that whole uh, Somali pirates shutdown for for several years. Yeah, just let it go back to being untouched, and I love the untouched side of things. Um, uh, you know, some incredible GT fishing, and that's that's something that I would, if I could get enough money for a kidney. Um, that's what, you know, on the black market, I'd be heading there, but I don't think I could, but you know, it, it's sort of $15,000 plus your flights, beers and tips for a week. And that's just never in a million years. Is that a, a, something that unless I get a lottery win, is that going to be a realization? Um, but that is top of my list of places that I would die to go to places to revisit. I would love to go back to Bassist India. Um, which is where we made our first film back in 2011. Remote underwater at all, remote underwater volcano rises up from 3,000 metres, slap bang in the middle of the Indian Ocean between Mozambique and Madagascar, middle of nowhere, 250 odd miles away from the nearest piece of land, Jurassic Park, but you can't get to it anymore. Um, it's been shut down basically by the French Navy, French forces. Like most of the places around that part of the world, the French lay claim to the vast majority of it. Um, and they, they've had issues there with the harvesting of sea cucumbers, amongst other things. And they've just said, we are not having this, go away, you little boats. So you can't go anywhere near the atoll anymore. Um, and, and having it being left on its own for so long without anybody fishing on it. Uh, I would love to go back there. Um, but as far as places that are special to me, um, the first place I fly, saw what a fly fish was Belize, which will always hold a, a, you know, a very special, special place in my heart. Mexico for an all round flats destination, I still think is one of the hardest places in the world to beat. Um, you know, you've got bonefish, you've got, tarpon you've got great snook fishing um not to mention jacks and triggers and everything else and you have the best permit fishery in the world um I, I, and as a permit junkie uh, you know that's that's like the drug for for a lot of saltwater fly fishermen um and that is for me i, I i've never been anywhere that betters it um and you can get 40 50 shots at permit in a day um, in the right conditions when the fish are around and, and it is a numbers game the more shots you have the more chance you've got to catch one um, and when you get in that numbers you you, you know we, I think our best trip was was 30 
30 permit landed for the trip. Um, and I think on one day between the group of us, we had 13 in one day. Uh, and Paul and myself had five to our five to our boat. He had three and I had two, which is phenomenal going anywhere. Um, so as far as the salt goes, those are the sort of three standout places for me. But um, trout fishing, I spent two and a bit weeks traipsing through New Zealand behind Mr. Proctor with a, a very heavy camera and tripod on my shoulder with a backpack with about another 20 kilos of stuff in it. Um, and the law of New Zealand is if you fall behind, you stay behind. And if you've ever fished with Paul, you'll know he's a bit of a bloody racing snake. When he gets the bit between his teeth, he's, he's off like a rat up a drain pipe. And, you know, it's not easy wading some of those rivers and stuff when you've got all that stuff on you. Um, and I saw some incredibly large fish in some of the most stunning scenery in the world. And I'd love to go back and spend some proper time fishing in New Zealand. Um, love Iceland, love the people, love the fishing there. Um, but just, it's a big place the world and we have a limited time here to see as much of it as we can. And I'd love just to see as much of it as I can. And I've been fortunate. I mean, I think I've done, I'm around 50 countries now, something along those lines in my life. Um, granted I haven't fished them all, but, um, there's a lot more places left to go and a lot more places left to fish. Um, so the bucket list is, is long. Um, it's just trying to tick off as many as I can. So, Fantastic. Very, very good answers and wonderful places. Um, we've been going over an hour now, and I wanted to – This, I feel like I've only scratched the surface. But, um, <laughs> yeah. I uh, about we 25 could... minutes. No, no, no. <laughs> we've, we've done really, really well, and there's so much more I wanted to talk to you about. But as someone who's worked in um, fly fishing shops, this must be a hard one because you're seeing so much stuff. But do you have a Hall of Fame rod? Is there one that you've said to yourself, wow, this is the one? Or is it something, because we're seeing these things with resins, everything else, that rods are continually making changes, evolving a little bit. But is there one that you've you've always felt, yeah, that's, that's the one? I... I did what a lot of people need to do, and I, I've had some big colds. Um, when I looked in the corner of the room and I was like, Jesus, wet. What have I got 40 rods sitting there for? And you, you, you have to start being brutal with it. You go, when did I last use that rod? Okay, two, no, out, out, out. So I knocked it right back um, to... to the bare hardcore of what I really need. So obviously I've got my, my, my saltwater rods, 8s, 10s, 12s, 9s, 16s. The trout side of things, uh, you know, I've got a little tiny rod I use for, for little rivers, sort of 7 foot 3 weight, um, which comes out once every two or three years, but kind of need to have it there for those little situations. The days that I used to have, like a 9 foot 4 weight and a 10 foot 4 weight, and I'd carry a couple of rods on the river, I've got nine and a half three weight which i pretty much use for everything now on a river whether i'm wading it or not um the obligatory 10 foot 7 weight which everybody has um i'm quite a big fan of a 9 foot 6 for a 6 so i've got one of those um and then the one rod that i've i've kind of held on to now for i don't know how many years probably 15 years is a 9 foot 5 weight four piece sage tcr which was my original distance casting rod which has stayed with me and probably will stay with me for, for good. Um, and I, I, you know, I sadly had to have a cull of one or two of my father's old rods after he passed away because a lot of them were two piece. So there was a nine foot eight weight two piece SP plus sage, which was a fabulous rod I used to use for, for bass fishing. But sticking a two piece rod in the car was just a pain in the ass. So two piece rods went, three piece salmon rods went and everything else. And I just, I sort of kicked them all the curb apart from what, what was the hardcore and, and certainly the TCR has stayed and I don't think that's going anywhere. Um, but if I was to buy new rods and replace them at the moment, I'm a massive fan of the new Sage Igniter. Um, I've had a bit of a play with uh, with one or two of the new rods that are coming through right now, but not enough play to sort of really um, have a solid opinion on some of the other ones out there at the moment. But I, I love the Igniter. It suits my casting. Um, and if I was buying new rods, I think that, that's 
from from the TCR through now to the Igniter, it's been quite a big change. But I think I know a lot of people still love their old XPs and things. And like a ten foot seven weight for an XP is like most people's unicorn. They never see them anywhere second hand, or people don't get rid of them. Um, but I think every time you sort of set your hopes on a rod being this is the one that's going to stay with me for the next twenty five years. They always bring something out a bit better, but quite often it's not just a bit better; it's a lot better. And then you go, mm, actually, might might lose the love for that one, and I'll go for this one. So, apart from a TCR, I think most most of my rods are pretty much replaceable in one way or another. So, yeah, that would be my only one that I've held onto and, and say I've never had a rod so long, and so I think it will stay around for a bit longer. Nice. If it's any consolation, I've had massive rod coals and I've still got my 5.8 TCR as well. And there's something <laughs> about it. And it was terrible to fish with um, for our little fish down here. I used to fish with it. I used to cast with it. I've done all sorts of stuff with it. And it's still a cracking rod. And yeah, there's something I couldn't tell you why. Um, I got rid of the 8.8 TCR, which I loved. I, and I kicked myself about that. I thought that was a great rod as well. But um, that 5.8 is fantastic. But it's been wonderful talking with you. If you mentioned guiding and stuff like that, how do people get hold of you if they want to have some tuition, if they want to um, do some guided fishing, if they want you to make them a film as well? How do they get hold of you? Uh, so, I mean, the easiest place to get a hold of me is just uh, info at smokingdragproductions.co.uk, which is S-M-O-K-I-N, so not smoking, smokingdragproductions.co.uk, um, and that's the email that I'm, I'm on. So, yeah, I mean, uh, I'm still currently sitting sitting on furlough waiting to get back to work, so, you know, there's the odd bit of guiding I'm doing. I'm out next week with a, a good friend of mine who very sadly suffers with Parkinson's, and, and I go along and spend three days with him being his... Uh, it is gilly for the day um but yeah otherwise once we're once we're back up and running at uh, sport fishing then that's where i'll be so but in the meantime yeah info at smoking drag uk. fantastic jt it's been always a pleasure to catch up with you and thanks for taking the time to chat with me today it's been a pleasure absolute pleasure pete nice to catch up as well and uh, hopefully we'll catch each other out on a, on a fishing bag somewhere that sounds pretty cool to me. Everyone, That this has been the Fly Culture Podcast. I hope you've enjoyed this one as much as me. Plenty more coming. Apologies the last few haven't been on YouTube. I've had some technical issues, but hopefully we'll get this one out there to you. But everyone, thank you so much for listening to the Fly Culture Podcast. <laughs>